What's up everyone out there and welcome back to another Addictive Fishing Tutorial. Today you're joining us for an awesome tutorial here on how to fish creeks, rivers, and streams with three of my very favorite methods, the way that I catch the most fish. So stick around, it's gonna be an awesome day. Let's go get some fish. So when we're fishing any kind of natural stream or river or, or creek system, I wanna go with things that are a little more natural. The fish that are gonna be living in these kind of areas are eating a lot of bugs, they're eating a lot of fish, and they're eating a lot of natural forage that's coming down the river. They're not a stock fish that's been thrown in here and that has been used to living off of pellets like they eat at the hatchery. So what I'm gonna show you today are three different methods that really imitate different things that these fish eat in the wild, as well as work really good for any style of trout to begin with. So what we're gonna start off talking first is about our fishing rod selection. In a place like this where I have the ability to catch really big fish, or maybe even fish that I didn't intend to catch, like a salmon or a steelhead, I wanna go with a rod that can handle a bigger fish, but also have fun when I'm fighting those smaller ones that I'm catching throughout the day. So what I have here is an Okuma Salido. This rod is seven and a half feet long and has a two to eight pound line rating. Why I like that rod action is because it's nice and flimsy at the tip and I can cast those light, light lures that I'm gonna be throwing into really tight spots throughout the day. Any rod will really work. I love Okuma, they are some of my favorite trout rods out there, but anything within that seven to eight foot range and anywhere in between two and 10 pounds will get it done out here on the creek. The reel I have on this same setup is my C30 Okuma Kaimar reel. Any sort of 30 series or 3000 series reel will work. You want something that's a little bit smaller so that it's nice to cast and it's not so cumbersome when you're walking through the brush and out walking along the creek or the river throughout the day. The line I put on this is a braided fishing line. Why I like the braid is because it's very, very sensitive, it's strong, and I can actually watch and see where my line is floating on the water as it's fishing. The kind of line that this is, is the Addicted Enforcer Braid in a 20 pound test. A 20 pound test might sound a little bit heavy, but it's just enough to be able to fight those big fish, as well as goes out of the guides very nicely when you're casting these light lures throughout the day. So at the end of my Enforcer line, what I have here is a 10 pound fluorocarbon bumper. Now anything from about a four to an eight to a 10 pound test is a line rating that you're gonna to wanna to use for the creek that you're fishing, depending on how dirty the water is and how mountain of a stream that it is. A lot of the really, really clear mountain streams, the line weight really can help. You're gonna to need to get something that those fish aren't gonna see and it's not gonna spook them before they see your presentation. But if you're fishing a, a river that's dirtier, has any sort of glacial tint to it, or is a little bit muddy, you can go up in eight to 10 pound test just because you know you might be catching a bigger fish. The way I've attached the fluorocarbon line to the braided line is with a blood knot. And we'll put a link down in the description to some of our knot tying tutorials. But really what I like to say is any sort of uni knot, there's blood knots, there's surgeon's knots, there's Alberto knots, there's different styles of knot that attach these two lines. But this is what I'm doing is attaching my braided line to my clear fluorocarbon line. And that's what's gonna not scare the fish is getting that fluorocarbon line a little bit further away from that braided line than it is at this moment. Another way to attach these two lines is with a little trick that I'm gonna show you right here. But I'm gonna do this from fluorocarbon to fluorocarbon since I already have my blood knot tied. But this will come work just fine in between the other two kind of lines, in between that braided line and your, your fluorocarbon line instead. So I'm gonna take a little barrel swivel, a little size six barrel swivel. I'm gonna run my line through just the one side of it. I'm gonna tie it tight with the normal fisherman's knot. Seven wraps around the line. Grab the main line, go back to the eye that you created, not the eye of the swivel. Lube it up and pull it tight. Okay, now that I have my main line attached to the swivel, I'm gonna take a piece of eight pound test and I'm gonna attach it to the other side of the swivel with the same hook, just a normal fisherman's knot. Now the first method we're gonna show you how to fish and teach today is probably the easiest and most dynamic and most universal method that is possible out there, and that's fishing a spinner and a rooster tail spinner to be more exact. And now the rooster tail I'd say is the most diverse and dynamic spinner out there because you can use it in so many different places and it's available just about anywhere in the world you wanna go fishing. These things are basically in every tackle store, almost every gas station, and almost anywhere you stop to buy fishing bait or fishing tackle in the world, you'll be able to find a rooster tail. So that's why I love them, they're easy, they're convenient, and if you get used to knowing how to fish them, you start catching a lot of fish wherever you go. So I'm gonna take this guy, this is my favorite pattern right here, the old sparkly trout with the silver or the gold blade. Now I'm gonna take that, put that through the eye of the eight pound test, do the same eight wraps, seven wraps rather, Lube it, tighten it, it's time to go fishing. Okay, so when we walk up to the creek, I'm gonna look for an area as beautiful as the one here in front of me. What makes spinner fishing so fun is how it works so well in so many different styles of water. But there is one style of water in particular that really excels with the spinner fishing in particular, and that is what you see here behind me. Why I'm identifying this as spinner water is because it's about the same depth across the entire run. 
If I look across the river here, it's about knee deep to about hip deep from here all the way to that far bank, only about 50 feet across, 60 feet across, and has lots of structure and different places for me to cast and those fish to hide. There's really no other way to be as effective covering all the water that's in front of me unless I'm doing the method that I'm about to show you here. So what I'm always gonna do when I start fishing a hole with a rooster tail or any kind of spinner is I'm gonna start at the very top of it. So here behind me, I have this nice shallow coming down to a bigger, deeper flat, and I'm gonna identify the top fast water as the top of the run. So let's walk up here and start our cast. Now the first thing I'm gonna make sure of when I walk up to a new fishing hole is that I don't cast across the river. One of my biggest pet peeves with people and one of the things that I think make people catch less fish every day they go fishing is that they cast too far on their first cast in every single run that they fish. And ultimately it makes you catch less fish because you don't catch those fish that are halfway across the river or in between you and that far bank. So always start close, start at the first place you think there would be a fish and then work your way out further. So my first cast is only gonna be about halfway across the river here. I'm gonna keep my rod tip pointed low. I'm gonna make sure that spinner blade's spinning and I'm gonna reel that thing all the way back into my rod tip. Now that I've made my first cast, I'm gonna cast all the way across the river, cutting that river in two different chunks. So I fished down in front of me here. I didn't get anything on the inside. Then I'm gonna cast all the way to that far bank at about 90 degrees to the other bank every time. I don't wanna to cast too far up river when I'm using these because a lot of times it won't get the current to grab that spinner blade. The thing won't start spinning and ultimately we won't be attracting the fish. So now that I've made those two casts, I fished close, I fished to the far. I'm gonna take two steps down river and make that same cast sequence. Oh, I just got hit. Oh, I just had him. Got him, got him. Oh, lost the first fish of the day. And you saw there, that fish grabbed it about eight feet from my rod tip. It probably followed it all the way across. And that's why it's important to fish that middle and then fish to the far. Third cast in, I already got a fish. I'm liking this. Oh, just got nailed again. Woo. And as you guys can see there, I'm trying my best not to yank really hard and set the hook when that fish bites. I want that thing to pull it, grab it, pull it tight, and actually set the hook by themselves instead of me yanking on it. What's gonna happen, I'm gonna catch that thing on the edge of the lip. He's gonna do a couple little cartwheels out there and he's gonna come off every time. So be patient, let the fish grab it, and swing it all the way back into your rod tip. Okay, now that I made those two casts, I'm gonna take two more casts down river. Even if I hooked one, I'm gonna be moving closer and closer to where he's at. Oh, there it was again. There's one under that log for sure. But still, I held back. I didn't cast over there first. I got that fishing done right in front of me, made sure there wasn't one in front of me, and now we're in the zone. Now we're in the zone. Patience pays off, come on. Right there, right there. You guys can see I'm keeping my rod tip down so that my spinner stays deep. I'm keeping my rod tip down. I'm just reeling very slow to make sure the blade's spinning out there, and I'm following my spinner the entire way as it comes across. That way I can have that maximum feel I can have that maximum sensitivity from every bit when I start to cast all the way through to the end. If something grabs it, I can feel it. Damn, there's no way there's not a trout over here. Okay, I fished my way all the way through the bottom of that run. And I'm gonna start at the bottom of the run and start working my way up as you go through here into each of these little spinner pockets. The beauty of a spinner is you can fish them in a very narrow window of passage. So right here I have these overhanging trees. I got this nice pocket underneath and there's two or three great hiding spots for a big trout here. So let's try it. Now this one, I'm not gonna mess it around. I'm not gonna waste my time. I'm gonna cast all the way up into where I actually wanna be fishing. Cause there's really only so much of an area for that. Oh, got him. There's really only so much of an area for those fish to be under there. And guess what? We found them. Beauty, beautiful little guy. Just a sweet little brook trout, a little honey of a brook trout. Beauty little guy, pulled him out of there. Heck yeah, fish number one of the day. Got oh, another one, there's another one. Oh, second cast right after I let him go. There's another one. Oh yeah, that's a better one too. Look at that guy. Oh, it's a different species even. It's a mountain whitefish. Heck yeah, it's a mountain whitefish. These things work for absolutely everything. Way to go rooster tail. Beauty little mountain white fish. Those are good eating, but you know what? Today, he's going back home. See you later, bud. All right, rooster tail, method number one. Let's go check out another method. 
Okay, we're back on the boat to talk about method number two. And honestly, it's probably one of my very favorite ways to catch these trout because it's so visual, it's so hands-on, and it's so fun. And it teaches you a lot about the, these fish's feeding habits and where they like to sit in the rivers. So method number two, addicted fix float and the micro worms. So the addicted trout float is one of my very, very favorite ways to catch any species of trout any time of year. Again, it's, it, the beauty of it is, is, to me, it's micro salmon and steelhead fishing. That's why I like it so much. And you get to watch visually that bobber go down in that moving current, and it's so much fun. Hopefully, you guys will see an example of it here in just a second. But this is how you set the setup up. I'm using the exact same rod setup I just explained to you guys. Same line, same everything, same 10-pound fluorocarbon bumper, about 10 feet of it off the back end, and the micro float is gonna go on the very end of my line here. So what I'm gonna do first is it comes with two rubber grommets. These two little rubber grommets here. The first one is just gonna go up my line, just like that. Now after I put that first rubber grommet on, I'm gonna slide my main line, the main line coming out of the end of my rod tip, through the side of this bobber, through these little holes that it comes with, just like so. Once that's through there, I take that first rubber grommet that I put on the line, get her a little wet, and stick that rubber grommet right on the top of that bobber itself. Now as you could guess, the second little grommet is gonna go on the line and then right on the end of the bobber. There we have it. Okay, after that, I'm gonna take the same setup that I had before, just a plain barrel swivel with eight pound test on the end of it. All I did was cut my spinner off, to be honest with you guys. Cut the spinner off and used the barrel swivel again. So I'm gonna slide the main line that comes out of the bottom of the, of the bobber onto the barrel swivel. And then I have my eight pound test, about two feet of it off the other end of that. Now, for the business end. What we have here are some Addicted Micro Jig Heads. These are 30 second ounce jig heads that you can find on our store, addicted.fishing. Most all the products that you see here today can be found on our shop uh, here at addicted.fishing. So you see the little links and the bubbles popping up alongside. If you guys wanna get some of this gear, go check out the website and get yourself some of this gear that I'm showing you here today. But this is a 30 second ounce black jig head here. I'm gonna just tie this directly to the end of my eight pound test below my bobber and my little barrel swivel. Same thing, fisherman's knot, seven wraps, lube it up, and there it is, there's our hook. Now that I have the hook on, I'm gonna go through and I'll show you guys a few different styles of our worms. This is the power bait Berkeley worm. Um, work really good, you guys have a nice scent to them, but we have a full line of colors and different styles of our micro worms that we have here at Addicted Fishing. So these are the two inch trout worms. We have three inch trout worms. There's big six inch worms that we use actually for salmon and steelhead fishing, but I find this to be one of the most effective methods here with just the smaller micro worms in all the different colors that we have. And my absolute favorite, Red Pearl. That's what we're gonna start with today. Why I like this color and I like a lot of the different colors like this one is because it's such a natural color. And this time of year, there's a lot of worms nests on the side of the river. There's a lot of just natural bug life falling off of the branches out into the water. And it's mainly what these fish are gonna be feeding on no matter where you're at in the country. So that looks just like a little mealworm coming out of a tree to me. Let's put it on our line, see if we can catch a fish. Okay, now we're gonna talk about identifying a spot to fish a bobber. Really all it equates to and really what it comes down to is just making sure it's deep enough to fish the bobber. It doesn't matter the speed, it doesn't matter the velocity of the water a lot of the time, but as long as you can get that jig down and get it in within that strike zone, these fish are very fast feeders and they will come out and grab this thing. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start in the same spot that I just caught the fish on the rooster tail. I'm gonna make sure I'm not too deep. I got my stuff set at about a foot and a half. I'm gonna look out, find the main channel or the best resting place for that fish, the best feeding lane and I'm gonna start in that close lane, and here we go. It's for all the marbles. Can he bring it together? The million dollar man. So, the biggest thing when you're fishing a bobber like this, or any sort of fixed float presentation, is your line management. One thing that's very, very imperative is that your line doesn't go downriver faster than your bobber itself. So as you watch as I go through and start fishing this run, I'm gonna be making sure to mend my line. And what I mean by mend is you're gonna grab your line you're gonna lift it and put it up current of your bobber and then continue to let that bobber float down into the fishing hole so that it goes through naturally. It's the same speed as the current and it looks as natural as possible to the fish. Once I get it to the end of my drift, I'm gonna leave my bell open and I'm gonna, oh, there's a fish, got him. Oh my God. Bobber down ski, total whiff -a rooney there. whiff -a rooney on the bobber down ski. So you saw what happened there. I was letting line out, I was letting that bobber coast down river with the current, a fish grabbed it, pulled it under, and what happened is I didn't close my bail and reel up my line quick enough to get to that fish and hook it. So 
That is the next key, and that's what I'm gonna explain next, is how to set the hook. That was a drainer, dude. Got him, got him, got him, that's a good one. I got him. Bobber down ski. Oh yeah. Now you guys could see how imperative my line management was there. I had my rod tip high. I was making sure that the inside current wasn't kicking me out of the fishing hole and that my bobber was staying over there in that slack water. And we got fish number two or three of the day. Cute little trout, just a beauty. Let's get him on his way. Fish on. So what I'm gonna explain the most, again, is using that close middle farm mentality here, like we talked about with the spinner. All my casts in a run like this are gonna start the first place I think there's a fish, which is gonna be the first third of this inside of the river. Oh my God, that was a bobber down. That was a bobber down all day long, all day long. But now that I made that inside cast, I'm gonna go again, an example, go midway across the river to my cast number two. Oh my God, no. Got it. <laughs> but now that I've made that first cast, I'm gonna go to my second cast, which is gonna be halfway across the river. Again, keeping my line tip high, keep, keeping the hitchhiker thumb up, thumb in the air, point it up, rod tip high, keeping as much line out the water as I possibly can, and keeping my bail open and letting it slowly take line out to go down river naturally at the same speed of the current. Oh, drain ski. Yuck. That guy was chomping it. He was ham sandwiched. Okay, method number two. Successful in the books. On to the third method. Okay, third method. It's last but not least at all. And it's absolutely my very favorite way to catch a fish in a small creek, stream, or river. And that is the sculpin jig. Now the twitching jig is something that's new to me. It was taught to me by a really good friend of mine, Bill Herzog, and it's really allowed me to really pinpoint some of the biggest fish in the river systems wherever I go to fish. What this thing is representing is an actual sculpin which live in most bodies of water, whether it's a slow body of water like a lake or a river-like situation. There's always sculpin of, of some species in a river system probably where you live in the United States or the world. But what I have here is just a rabbit fur jig. You can use any kind of hair jig, you can use a steelhead jig, anything that's around a quarter ounce in weight or eighth ounce in weight will work fine, as long as it's within the same color scheme. A black jig, any sort of hair jig, any normal steelhead jig or marabou jig it will work as long as it's in a little bit darker color. These ones here I've hand tied myself with rabbit fur and it really does represent the sculpin well. And we put a little picture of a sculpin here up in the left of the camera and you can see the difference in the colors and the difference in the shape that this thing is to a sculpin. But the idea that we're really talking about here is the jigging motion that we're gonna be doing while doing this. So I'm gonna use the same rod, same line, same everything set up that I've showed you before, but I'm gonna attach this little eighth ounce jig to the end and go find us a big fish. Let's do it. Okay, so right behind us here, everybody, we have the quintessential twitching spot. And what makes it a twitching spot, one, is that it's slow, two, it's deep, and three, it is the perfect habitat for a place that a sculpin would live. These little critters like to live out of the current. They live in the areas that there's a lot of waste and, and different stuff floating around them so they can feed off the bottom. Um, all those dead eggs, all those dead insects, everything that gets flushed into these sides of the river is where these little sculpins wanna live, AE, that's where these big trout will be eating them. So, let's go ahead and show you the method. This one here, I am gonna start with a pretty far cast. And what I wanna really, really try to do here is not so much jig and pull that jig very hard and move it along quickly, I wanna swim it. I'm gonna just be doing these little dory effects, I call it, just the swimming, let's keep swimming. Imagine it's just a little sculpin down there swimming in the rocks, coming up out of the rocks, making little kicks, and trying not to be detected by the big trout. So I made that first cast over here. I'm gonna work this thing clockwise. And I'm just gonna be, again, doing this, oh, there he was, son of a, oh, got him again. Oh my God. I'm gonna get right back in there. Gonna get right back in there. Oh, he just hit it. A lot of times these things will follow this all the way back to you. So you have to keep jigging, you have to stay ready. Oh, there, oh. Yep, that's a fish, that's a fish. He's right here, right in the frickin', right at my feet. He followed that thing all the way back through this. Oh, that's a nice rainbow too. Come to Papa, oh, that's the best fish of the day. 
What do you know? On the coaching jig. There he is. Wow. Look at that fish. Freaking big old jig right through the nose. Just clobbered it. Oh, let's get him back in the water. Boy, he wanted that jig. Okay, buddy, we'll see you later. Heck yeah. No surprise that we got the biggest fish on that. That is not an uncommon thing. Let's see if we can get another one. And one thing I find to be very important with this is just keeping it off the bottom. It's not a bad thing to let that jig fall down on the bottom just for a split second, but really you just wanna be swimming along. Twiddle and men. Life's all about twiddles and men's when it comes to this. So I'm just doing these small little motions like that thing's tail whipping, just swimming along, and I'm keeping a nice steady reel the whole time, bouncing that thing back to me. Well, everybody, as you see here today, these three methods are foolproof and very effective when fishing any kind of creek, stream, or river. Now, a lot of this knowledge is stuff that I've been accumulating for over 20 years, you guys, so take each part of it with a grain of salt. Take the methods that you like, utilize them well, go out and have fun, and remember to always get back to Mother Nature where you can. If you guys want to see more fun and educational videos just like you saw here today, go up here and click the link in the next video. Go down here, hit subscribe, turn those bells on, give this video a thumbs up, and comment below, and you can be the comment of the day just like this person right here. Thanks so much for watching today, everybody. You all stay fishy. We'll see you out there.